Chapter 1. Obesity is no longer just for adults. It's a pandemic that's affecting children, too. In the years 1977 to 2000, the prevalence of childhood obesity skyrocketed in every age category. Obesity in children aged 6 to 11 increased from 7% to 15.3%. For children aged 12 to 19, it more than tripled from 5% to 15.5%. Obesity-related diseases like type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure, previously rare in children, are becoming more common. Obesity has metastasized from being solely an adult concern to being a pediatric one, too. Obesity is caused by both biological and environmental factors. Childhood obesity leads to adult obesity and many future health problems, particularly cardiovascular issues. Childhood obesity is a predictor of increased mortality, but most importantly, also a reversible risk factor. Overweight children who become normal weight as adults have the same mortality risk as those who have never been overweight. Obesity is an energy balance problem, one of either eating too much or exercising too little. Since six-month-olds eat only on demand and are often breastfed, it is impossible to say they eat too much. Since six-month-olds do not walk, we can't also say they exercise too little. Similarly, birth weight has also increased by as much as half a pound, 200 grams, over the last 25 years. Newborns cannot eat too much or exercise too little. What is going on here? It's insulin. The answer is simpler once we understand the hormonal obesity theory. This tidbit examines the causes of obesity as well as the dangers attached to it. In the subsequent chapters, you'll learn more about how to lose weight effectively. Did you know? The fruits and vegetables you see in the supermarket have been shipped anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 miles on average to get there. When food travels, it begins a long, slow death. This slow death depletes the nutrients of the food we eat, so our bodies are never really being nourished with what we need for optimum health. Chapter 2 Insulin is the main hormonal driver of weight gain in children. Where can an infant get high insulin levels? From his or her mother. Dr. David Ludwig, an American physician from Boston, recently examined the relationship between the weights of 513,501 women and their 1,164,750 offspring. Increased maternal weight gain is positively correlated with increased neonatal weight gain. Because the mother and the fetus share the same blood supply, all hormonal imbalances, such as high insulin levels, are automatically and directly transmitted through the placenta from the mother to the growing fetus. Insulin, when left unchecked, triggers health issues that can cause obesity or death. The consequence of too much insulin in newborns is the development of insulin resistance. This leads to even higher levels of insulin in a vicious cycle. Thus, high insulin levels produce obesity in the newborn as well as the six-month-old infant. The origins of both infant obesity and adult obesity are the same. Insulin. They are two sides of the same coin. Babies born to mothers with gestational diabetes mellitus have three times the risk of obesity and diabetes later in life, and one of the biggest risk factors for obesity in young adulthood is obesity in childhood. Those who are obese in childhood have more than 17 times the risk of obesity going into adulthood. Even large for gestational age babies, whose mothers do not have gestational diabetes, are also at risk. They have double the risk of metabolic syndrome. The sad but inevitable reality of our world is that we are now passing on our obesity to the next generation. And this is so because we have made it possible for our children to be exposed to insulin starting in the womb. The implication of this is that they are prone to obesity sooner than ever before. 
early obesity is difficult to get rid of, and it gets worse. Fat babies become fat children and obese adults. Chapter 3. Why We Need a New Framework for the Understanding and Treatment of Obesity The first thing you will learn in medicine is the fact that no medicine is safe. By propagating this theory, they have been able to uphold bad drugs for generations. Even after discovering that a drug is not good, doctors still propagate these drugs from generation to generation. Despite the lack of effectiveness, these bad medicines often remain in the market for a very long time. Examples of bad treatment methods used by doctors include the use of leeches, bleeding, and the use of routine tonsillectomy. Another problem in which the medical treatment of doctors has proved ineffective is the problem of obesity. Obesity is a widespread problem that involves excessive body fat, which increases the chances of health problems in kids and adults. Obesity is calculated as the value of an individual's weight in kilograms divided by the square of their height in meters. The result is referred to as the body mass index. If this value is greater than 30, it is considered obese. For over 30 years, doctors prescribed a low-fat, calorie-reduced diet as a treatment for obesity, but statistics show that the number of obese people in Canada tripled between 1985 and 2011, despite the population's adherence to the recommended treatment method provided by doctors. Due to the failure of doctors to solve the problem, Dr. Jason Fung began searching for answers. He described the ineffectiveness of books on obesity. This was because the books were based on the opinion of respected doctors who contradicted each other. He further pointed out that to truly find solutions, we must focus on evidence-based medicine rather than vague opinion. If you truly desire answers to the questions, what makes people add weight? How do people get fat? You will have to search beyond literary books. The opinions of authorities on obesity are flawed because the theoretical frameworks on which these opinions are based are also flawed. The current theories on obesity fail to address multiple causes and factors that lead to obesity. The theories simply take one factor into consideration. Excess calories cause obesity. Excess carbohydrates cause obesity. Excess meat consumption causes obesity. Excess dietary fat causes obesity. Too little exercise causes obesity. In reality, chronic diseases like obesity are multifactorial, all of which contribute to the disease at varying degrees. It is therefore faulty to attribute the cause of obesity to a single factor. Challenging the already accepted theories is, at best, unsettling. However, ignoring this faulty reasoning line has grave consequences. Chapter 4 Our understanding of obesity is heavily flawed because we mostly focus on the wrong causes. The first proof that doctors have no clue why people get fat is that there are fat doctors. The question is, why would a doctor who is aware of the complications that could result due to the accumulation of fat allow himself to get fat? The answer is simple. The doctor does not understand the factors that control weight loss and weight gain. Some might say doctors do not desire to lose weight. If this is true, it questions the notion that being overweight will make you vulnerable to multiple diseases. The conventional recommendation given to overweight individuals is, eat less, move more. It is the obvious solution, but if you take it into consideration, eating less and moving more does not lead to weight loss. The advice of doctors is faulty. That is why their prescriptions can't consistently produce positive results. To truly understand obesity, we must consider the root cause of the disease. Fat is made up of calories, and the accumulation of fat is the accumulation of calories. Hence, obesity is simply caused by the accumulation of calories. It occurs when your system stores more calories than it uses. Obesity occurs when calories taken in are more than they are lost. 
A calorie is a unit ascribed to food energy. It is a measure of the amount of heat a particular food type produces. When the body has more than enough calories, it stores the excesses in fat cells. When the calories in, food energy that we eat, are more than the calories out, food expended for various metabolic functions, the end result is fat accumulation. It may interest you to know our ancestors were not burdened by issues of obesity. The traditional diets seldom contained excess calories. However, today's civilized world has given us refined carbohydrates of sugar and starches, which are packed with calories. Chapter 5 The Calorie Reduction Error is an important topic that everyone must be familiar with. From the point obesity became a recognized problem in society, it was viewed as an indication of how different individuals process calories. To simplify the theory, assumptions were put forward, but in Dr. Fung's view, these assumptions were not good for anyone trying to lose weight. Simply burning calories does not guarantee weight loss. Assumption 1. Calories in and calories out are independent of each other. This assumption is completely wrong because the two variables are mutually dependent. By reducing one, you will also reduce the other. Reduce the number of calories you consume. Your body system will also reduce the number of calories it uses to carry out body functions. Assumption 2. Basal metabolic rate is stable. Through numerous recommendations from respected doctors, we have been programmed to focus on calorie intake without making any consideration of its expenditure except for exercise. This is partly because it is not difficult to take into account a level of caloric intake, but measurement of calorie output is not easy. Total energy spent by humans is the addition of basal metabolic rate, the thermogenic effect of food, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, and exercise done. This means that the total energy spent can fluctuate by as much as 50%, depending on the intake of calories and other factors. Let's face the truth. Low-calorie diets have been tried again and again and again. They fail every single time. Dr. Jason Fung Assumption 3. Fat stores are essentially unregulated. Any individual with an understanding of the body will know that every system in the body is regulated by hormones. Even though all the systems have hormones regulating them, doctors have made us believe that fat cells' growth is unregulated. And as a result, by simply regulating what you eat, you can regulate your body weight. This is a bald-faced lie that has misled people for more than 30 years. Assumption 4 a calorie is a calorie. A calorie is not just a calorie. If this were the case, that would mean that the only important variable in weight gain is calorie intake. Chapter 6. Insulin can make you fat if you fail to control what you eat. Although controlling weight loss has somehow eluded the smartest minds, the cause of weight gain has been common knowledge for some time now. Weight gain can be caused by consuming insulin. Once insulin is included in the mix, all your efforts to remain in shape will be wasted. You could eat carefully, exercise regularly, but as long as insulin is included in your diet, you will get fat. Why is insulin so powerfully fat-inducing? Insulin levels are very high in obese individuals both before and after meals. Hence, to lose weight, an obese person needs to somehow reduce his insulin levels. Measuring the insulin level in a person's body is very difficult because it fluctuates throughout the day in response to food consumption. However, an average insulin level can be measured. Fasting insulin, which is the measure of an individual's insulin level after an overnight fast, is a simpler way to measure insulin. Numerous studies have revealed the close association between high fasting insulin levels and obesity. Reducing insulin levels will directly reduce weight loss. For instance, the SGLT2 
sodium glucose linked transporter inhibitors, which lower glucose and insulin levels significantly, are a perfect example of the effect of insulin reduction on weight. If you want to avoid weight gain, remove all added sugars from your diet, Dr. Jason Fung. An extreme example of insulin reduction on weight can be seen by observing type 1 diabetic patients. Type 1 diabetes is a disease that damages the insulin-producing beta cells of the pancreas. This causes insulin to fall to very low levels. Blood sugar goes up, but the height of this condition is severe weight loss. When weight loss occurs, the insulin levels drop slower. As a result, patients are given daily shots of insulin to keep their insulin level regulated. The case is reserved for people who desire to lose weight. Even though the procedure is dangerous, people looking to lose weight often undergo a diabulimia procedure. Diabulimia is the deliberate underdosing of insulin for the purpose of weight loss. The process is very effective. Chapter 7 With careful monitoring and evaluation of your diet, you can live healthy. The higher your insulin secretion rate, the more obese you become. Obesity is not the result of excessive food consumption, but the effect of an error in hormonal fat regulation. Dr. Jason Fung has pointed out a step-by-step -step guide that will help you reduce your insulin levels and lose weight. Step 1. Reduce your consumption of added sugars. Sugar is a major factor that leads to higher insulin secretion. The effects of sugar affect insulin levels in both long and short terms. When you consume sugar, it immediately increases the amount of insulin present in your body, and it keeps increasing for a long period. The process that leads to increased insulin secretion is known as insulin resistance. Today, sugar is in almost everything we eat, in the natural and unprocessed foods, as well as manufactured and processed foods. As a result, avoiding sugar can't be accomplished by simply taking sugar off your dining table. It is important to note that some processed foods are 100% sugar. To live a healthier life, you should stick to eating natural foods. Step 2. Reduce your consumption of refined grains. Consumption of refined grains, such as white flour, causes insulin secretion to a higher degree than any other food. Reducing the amount of these grains and white flour in your diet will reduce your weight. Processed flour has absolutely no nutritional value. It can be removed from your diet completely. Also, avoid bakery foods. These foods are simply concentrated sources of carbohydrates. Step 3. Moderate your protein consumption. Although proteins can't be eliminated from your diet, you must moderate your level of protein consumption to 20 or 30% of your total calories. Step 4. Increase your consumption of natural fats. There are three major macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. The least insulin-stimulating nutrient is fat. Contrary to the name, dietary fat is not fattening. When selecting fat for consumption, always go for natural fats. Step 5. Increase your consumption of protective factors. Consuming fiber lowers the insulin-stimulating potency of carbohydrates. Fruits, berries, vegetables, and whole grains provide enough fiber. Consuming these foods will help you against obesity. Conclusion if cortisol response and excessive stress are causing obesity, then the treatment is to reduce stress. But that's easier said than done. Avoiding stressful situations is important but not always possible. Family and work demands won't go away by themselves. Fortunately, there are time-tested methods of stress relief that can help us cope. While it's true that some stress is inevitable, you must maximize your time by creating a priority list, as this will help you drop some unnecessary things that stress you. Stress relief is a process that requires accepting that you are overworking yourself and that you must be conscious about what expends your energy. It's a misconception that stress relief involves sitting in front of the TV and doing nothing. 
Note, it is not possible to relieve stress by doing nothing. Stress relief is an active process. Meditation, yoga, religious practice, tai chi, and massage are all good choices. Regular exercise is an effective way to relieve stress and lower cortisol levels. Obesity is fast becoming a worldwide problem and, sadly, the end doesn't seem to be in sight. There are now more obese people in the world than there ever was. The exposure to consumables that contain high levels of fat is also not helping matters. Almost every soda drink has a very high level of sugar and they dominate the market. Overcoming obesity is not easy and because there are so many wrong techniques, people find it difficult to lose weight. The majority of the weight loss plans being sold or publicized to the public lack enough empirical analysis to back up their efficacy. The best weight loss plan lies in your decision to stop some bad habits and adopt new ones. The new habits can be very difficult when you start, but through determination and hard work, you should be able to pull through. Try this. The following are simple but effective ways to improve sleep hygiene. Sleep in complete darkness. Sleep in loose-fitting clothes. Maintain regular sleeping hours. Try to get 7 to 9 hours of sleep each night. See the light first thing in the morning. Keep your bedroom slightly cool. Do not keep a TV in your bedroom. Avoid exercises that make you weak for a long period. Eat well and keep track of your diet and weight.